So now that we've learned about the four situations, the four different combinations of variables of endothermic, exothermic, more ordered, more disordered, we're going to look at this in terms of a real life reaction. Now, I'd love to be able to do this demo for you virtually, but I'll just kind of describe it. Uh, you actually did see this reaction earlier in the year when we were doing our first round of thermo, but I'll kind of remind you of it and how it works and uh, we'll look at it from a, a new perspective now that you know about Gibbs free energy. So what I would have done if we had been together is to measure out 16 grams of a solid barium hydroxide octahydrate and five and a half grams of ammonium chloride. And they react according to that reaction there. So we're gonna take two solids, put them together into an Erlenmeyer flask. And I would take those two solids and then cap off that Erlenmeyer flask with a stopper and the reason why I put the stopper in, if you slosh those two solids around and they start to react, it starts to turn into barium chloride dihydrate, a solid, um, some ammonia gas. And so that's why I would put the stopper in the top so you don't have to breathe in that stopper. And then it also makes eight moles worth of liquid water. So it's really kind of an interesting reaction that you start with two solids, you slosh them around and it turns into liquid. It looks kind of uh, interesting. Right? And so what we're going to see is if that reaction is thermodynamically favorable or not under standard conditions. In other words, if you just put those two chemicals together and slosh them around, do they turn into the barium chloride dihydrate ammonia and water all by themselves without any outside intervention? Or does the reaction require assistance in order to make those products? Let's find out. So we are given a data table here with all our delta H of formations and our delta S values as well, uh, all under standard conditions. That's what that little zero is for delta H zero F and delta S zero F, that little uh, O there means standard conditions, 298 Kelvin room temperature uh, scenario. So let's start using these numbers, plugging it into our Gibbs free energy equation and find out what happens. So there's that data table repeated for your convenience once again, and we know our Gibbs free energy equation is delta H minus T delta S. So let's find just the delta H part. So the delta H part, we have to do products minus reactants. So we have one mole of that barium chloride dihydrate, two moles worth of ammonia, and eight moles worth of liquid water. We take those products, and subtract out our reactants, the barium hydroxide octahydrate and the two moles worth of ammonium chloride. That piece of the puzzle tells us that the delta H of reaction is positive 63.48. So we have an endothermic reaction going on. So keep that information in the back of your mind here. Uh, if we're trying to figure out the spontaneity of this reaction, is it thermodynamically favorable in the forwards reaction way or not? So there's the delta H piece, endothermic. This reaction, if I, we had been in class together, I'd walk around with the flask and let you guys all feel the outside of the flask would feel cold because it has to steal the heat from the surroundings, from your hands, from the room uh, in order to break those bonds uh, in that barium hydroxide octahydrate and um, our ammonium chloride endothermic. Let's look at the, uh, the state of order or disorder that we have going on here. So delta S, we do our products minus our reactants. So we need the delta S of that barium chloride dihydrate, the two moles worth of ammonia and eight moles worth of water. We do products minus reactants, so we subtract out the one moles worth of barium hydroxide octahydrate and two moles worth of ammonium chloride, and we get a positive 368.08 joules per Kelvin, which I'm going to switch into kilojoules per Kelvin just to make it unit compatible with my delta H that I just found on the previous slide. So if it's positive S, 
it's becoming more disordered, which you probably could figure out just by looking at the reaction itself, that we went from three moles worth of solid to 11 moles worth of some solid, some gas, and some liquid. So we're, we're increasing in moles and we're increasing in the types of matter that we have. Solids in the beginning, gases and liquids at the end, more disorder, positive S. So now we have to decide, would this reaction be thermodynamically favorable? It's endothermic, so it's stealing heat energy from the surroundings in order to make that reaction go. That doesn't really seem like a win for the universe to give up some of its energy to help this reaction along. However, it is creating something that's more disordered. That does seem like a win for Mother Nature there because that's the direction that matter just tends to go to on its own anyway. So we have an endothermic but more disordered. And we said in order to make that be spontaneously favorable in the forward direction there, thermodynamically favorable, we'd have to, it would be temperature dependent. If that T was a big number, then your delta H positive minus big T delta S, you're going to end up getting a negative G spontaneous in the forward direction, thermodynamically favorable in that forward reaction. If the T is a small number, when we do positive H minus that little t delta S, we'd end up getting a positive G thermodynamically favorable in the reverse direction. Uh, so let's find out. If we go to plug in that T, the temperature at which all those measurement, those numbers are measured at, is standard conditions, 298 Kelvin, which is roughly the temperature of what our classroom would be. And when we plug in that 298, you'd get a value of negative 46.2 kilojoules. That means it is thermodynamically favorable under standard conditions. So if I were to mix those two chemicals in a flask, they would make the products barium chloride, ammonia, and water all on their own without any outside intervention from me.